Welcome everyone to today's webinar. It's time to synergize clinical excellence and revenue integrity. Here's how. I'm Aliyah Pavla with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. David Bowers is the CDI Product Manager at 3M Health Information Systems. At 3M, David leads efforts to improve patient care and clinical documentation through enhanced artificial intelligence and natural language understanding technologies. Currently, he is focused on leveraging and adapting these technologies to support the market with COVID-19 specific initiatives. Prior to working at 3M, David earned his BS in Health Information Management from the University of Pittsburgh. Kathy Harkness is the CDI Client Engagement Executive at 3M Health Information Systems. Kathy has over 30 years of professional experience in critical care, emergency medicine, cardiac surgery, nursing management, as well as CDI and revenue integrity. She is a graduate of Walden University with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Currently, she is working as a CDI technology subject matter expert, providing operational insights around HCC's CDI workflow and query management. Prior to starting with 3M and Modal as a CDI client engagement executive, she was a clinical director with the advisory board company's Revenue Cycle Solutions Consulting and Management Division. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to David to begin today's presentation. Thank you and good day, everyone. So first, let's uh, touch on our agenda and cover some of the items that we're looking for you to learn through today's session. So the first thing that we're looking to do is talk about how it's possible to reduce gaps in the CDI process by leveraging different types of technology. We're also looking at uh, how to explore engaging providers in more effective ways. And by providing um, more effective means of communication, we can drive outcomes and reduce burden simultaneously. Uh, all of this can be done through a closed loop workflow. Um, so now if we move into our next slide, um, we want to start by introducing just a handful of the different trends that we're seeing impacting healthcare today. So of course we would be remiss to not start with COVID-19. So COVID-19 of course is one of those trends that is impacting a lot of our healthcare organizations today. And because of the limited resources that we already have um, within our hospitals, uh, the extra stress and burden that we're putting on those resources, that's leading to higher likelihood of burnout from the clinician angle, which of course brings us into the second trend, which is the clinician burnout itself. So this is the physical and the mental exhaustion of the increased demands that we're putting on this population without any emphasis on the clinician satisfaction side of the uh, different workflows. Um, through all of this, there are multiple silos that are built into the organizations that we're part of today. And because of having too many siloed operations with um, great clinical insights being derived, we're just not effectively transferring or sharing those clinical insights with other groups. Um, not to mention that there's always that pressing need for your clinician engagement, which is difficult to get considering how much we're consi uh, consistently asking from them. And finally, another one of the trends we see is how technology is helping with the healthcare market. Um, technology and the AI included shouldn't inhibit our clinicians, but instead should augment and enhance existing workflows to unify the disjointed ones. So next up, we're going to uh, jump into a slide. I apologize, can everyone see slide four? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so uh, you've probably seen this picture before if you've joined any of the 3M and modal uh, presentations in the past. And we like to use this picture, um, even though it was first published in 2011, it still is absolutely relevant to today's market. So the ultimate cost of technology in healthcare um, is when it's not done correctly or when a workflow is broken, which I think this picture really helps to exemplify. Um, this picture is of a girl who kind of drew up a picture of what her visit to her PCP office was like. And you can see here that the provider over on the left-hand side of the picture um, has their back turned to the patient and her family. And because of this, it felt that the patient care was being kind of pushed to the side to, in, uh, to allow for the documentation uh, workflow to complete. Um, so patient care in itself, of course, is a workflow, and disruption in this type of workflow leads to the patient dissatisfaction. So just another area that we need to be focused on um, and making sure that the providers and the clinicians working with the technologies are able to give that time to care um, to the patient while simultaneously getting all of their work accomplished. So there is an age-old uh, saying that uh, time is one of our most precious resources, and that definitely applies here in the healthcare spectrum. Providers really just want to focus on delivering high-quality care, um, and there are so many studies out there that identify when um, that high-quality care is impacted by administrative tasks on the provider's wellness, um, administrative uh, tasks that are impacting their job satisfaction, and this is during normal times. Um, of course, this is even more pressing now that we're in a healthcare crisis with COVID, um, how it's, it's even more important to make sure that we're giving as much time back to the providers as possible so that way they can do what is being requested of them. And this is done through uh, a couple of means of engaging with the provider early on. So this slide has a couple of animations in it to kind of help tell the story of where these pillars are coming together. So this uh, merging of the 3M and the M modal technologies brings with it many synergies that aid in a full end-to-end -end closed loop workflow. The marrying of the revenue cycle and the value-based uh, care expertise from 3M with the clinician focus of the M modal technologies enables us to leverage and share those technologies across the platform in several different ways. Um, this marriage is ultimately helping to make sure all of the pillars become stronger and more effective. And with that, Kathy, I will pass the slides over to you. Thank you, Davey. Well, everything that David just discussed really, you know, involves our products and what we envision as our, our main philosophy at 3M is really that focus on quality and the accurate revenue becomes our byproduct. And when I say accurate revenue, I mean appropriate. I mean not more, not less, but what is based on the accuracy of the documentation. And I think that's really pivotal when you talk about um, documentation opportunities and how, um, you know, so many people are looking at our documents and how do we, what our philosophy really evokes is that confidence that when we do the right thing, the right thing happens. So, but how do we know we're telling our story in a way that people can understand that we have integrity and that we're telling that patient story in a way that makes sense? Um, you know, right now, you know, quality and accuracy um, really pivots around understanding that information and really understanding the difference between what is data and what is information. And they're not the same, right? Data is that raw, unorganized fact. These are things that are simple, they may seem random, there's really un, uh, not a way to really understand the complexity that maybe a data set might um, represent. Information is when we actually take those data points and we process and organize and structure it and, and dare say map it in a way that gives it that context. And what we're going to talk about is that clinical, that clinically centric context, you know, that clinical information and how do we close the loop between what takes place, you know, right there at the gamble, right there at the patient experience, and then translate that into where we need to send it. Um, so right now, I'm going to use a COVID application because I feel like, you know, obviously this is really something that's fresh in our minds. Where a lot of people are struggling. You know, we need to report COVID data. That's the wisdom that we have the wisdom to know that, you know, uh, CMS and the CDC they they want to know this information. So how do we do that? Well, I have the knowledge. I have, I know that I have COVID-19 patients. 
Um, you know, and how does that, how do I have that knowledge? Well, I gather information. You know, I have patient A, they're on a ventilator. Um, they may have a COVID, um, you know, positive test. They're being suctioned every hour. They're sedated. They have vital signs every hour. We might even have them in a, in a pronated state, you know, face down, which is not an easily tasked by our, our, our healthcare facility, our workers, and they're requiring one-to-one -one care. If I just use simple data points to articulate or translate that story, I might get an intubation code. I might have a vent code. I might have the fact that, you know, SNOMED would, you know, map the fact that I have to transition the patient in, in different ways. Um, you know, SNOMED ontology will also allow me to, you know, get credit for suctioning and intensive care time and sedation. But all of those data points don't necessarily send that picture. Mm -hmm. So what we really want to do is create that closed loop translation. And we want to make sure that we have clinical intelligence to really speak to this. So David's going to show you the next step in how we would aggregate and form it, formulate that information to tell that story. Thanks, Kathy. David? <laughs> so, uh, like Kathy mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit more about closing the loop here, but what does closing the loop mean and how do we apply what Kathy just mentioned to the closed loop workflow? So to summarize, uh, closing the loop with real-time clinical intelligence, um, we can use that to accelerate capture of information and provide actionable, actionable insights at the same time. Um, it's important to remember to use these technologies in the context of the electronic health record and the actual clinician workflows. The goal is that we do not want to take any of the clinicians to an alternative workflow so that way we can continue to decrease the burden that we're putting onto that population. Um, so to kind of talk through the closed loop workflow, it really is derived of three items, capture, insight, and action. So as we're capturing clinical documentation, our NLU is reasoning over it and creating that insight, that structured information that allows us to then work with information models to drive actions to the providers by which of the actions will improve the clinical documentation and the capture of that information. And that is really how the circle just continues to go, uh, go round. So um, through the use of a closed loop workflow, we can drive the adoption of technology by lowering the bar for the integration of that technology. But it's not just about speech recognition or documentation capture. Um, it also needs to include our natural language understanding. Um, so our cloud-based NLU platform is designed to understand what is going on with the patient clinically, um, not just uh, what has been documented or the words that are on the screen. So teaching the system, for example, to understand whether or not the patient has heart failure, not just that a note says the words heart failure. Um, so through this animation, I'm hoping to explain a little bit more on the difference between NLP and NLU. And we're going to use heart failure because it's one of our go-to examples. And in the market, heart failure continues to be an issue that CDI specialists deal with on a day in and day out basis. So what you see here represented by this dark gray inner circle is NLP or natural language processing. Um, this is where you can identify SNOMED codes, your certainties of the different conditions. Um, and SNOMED is just one example. It really could be any standard ontology here. Um, SNOMED we use a lot within um, our platform today because it has built into it a familial hierarchical relationship between all of the different codes. And that's extremely beneficial when building out um, an LNLU code base. Um, next up, we want to take a look at our uh, light gray layer, which is our understanding layer. Now, this understanding layer is what really converts things from NLP to NLU. So the understanding layer gives us the determination of what the if is, if the patient has the condition. So with this layer, we're looking at additional items like treatments, manifestations, medications, lab results, radiology findings, and so many more. And that's all dependent on which use case you would be looking at. And then finally, in order to complete the full picture, um, we need to add in this blue layer wrapped around, which is our application layer. And this layer is what makes it a complete clinical intelligence platform. Each of these application layers are built to solve a very specific organizational problem. And the clinical models that support these different applications can be extended as the world of medicine changes. 
So what I mean by that is um, we saw a couple of years back that HFREF and HFPEF were uh, new synonyms added in for heart failure and were able to be used for coding and for diagnosis. Um, because of that, we had to extend our clinical core, which is the dark gray inner circle and the heart failure, to be able to accept those synonyms. But the positive of building out an NLU platform the way that it's been done here is because the application wraps around it, it allows us to be much more nimble and just add over that NLU core. So by making changes to the heart failure core, we can impact any application that uses that same core with some of these standard updates. So really just as a, an overview of this slide and what is the difference between NLU, natural language understanding, and NLP, natural language processing, is simply put, NLU is NLP on steroids. It's much more contextual. It looks at the information around the uh, clinical documentation in your note and can also reach back into the encounter to pull out other pieces of information as well to help in the clinical decision-making process. So how does all of this information manifest itself at the application layer? Well, we do this through an explainable UI that allows for a clinician intuition to be the training tool and for complex clinical information models to be more easily digestible by the end user. So we're bringing in all of those same relevant findings that, apologies for that, all of those same relevant findings that you would have seen through that NLU wheel previously, but in a way where the clinician's not going to have to dig and try to understand what's going on, we're presenting it in a way that will give the information up front as small as necessary, so that way they can get in and get out and continue with their workflow. Because again, the point of the applications and our NLU is to bring um, awareness to the providers and also bring efficiencies with it. So explainable UIs can exist for many different workflows. So you can see here are a couple of the various applications that we have available that um, are able to be centered over top of that clinical core. And because all of this um, is done through a way of sharing that clinical core, that allows for those edits to be widely deployed to various applications, which we already mentioned, but it also makes it uh, easier and quicker for expansion into new markets and new areas such as COVID-19, where kind of at the beginning, first quarter into second quarter of this year, we were able to extend our clinical information models to capture COVID-19 and help with uh, treatment plans, diagnosis, and just awareness of where the COVID-19 patients are in your population. So that's just a really uh, fitting example of how we were able to um, continue to use our NLU core to drive additional value to the market. So let's dive into a couple of examples of nudges. Um, so first, let's start with our clinical documentation improvement nudges. So here you can see on the screen, um, the provider has a nudge for heart failure, and this is looking for the acuity and type to be documented. So this really isn't too dissimilar from the full provider queries that uh, your CDI teams may be sending today. Of course, it's much more abbreviated because we have a limited amount of screen real estate, but we're trying to get it to the right point um, at the right time for that provider. So what we have here is softly nudging the provider to increase specificity in workflow, and that will aid in more accurate documentation, better patient care overall, and then of course that downstream financial impact of having that added specificity um, put into the documentation. Um, oh, let me actually go back. I want to mention one other thing here. Um, this also adds the ability to do in-workflow education with the provider as an alternative to classroom trainings. Um, this gives that clinician more practical experience and application of these educational items, which I'm going to touch on in a little bit here as well. But now moving on to the second type of nudge um, that we want to review today is more related to population management and HCC reviews. So this is really nudging in the form of a suggested billing diagnosis based on your current note. And that's helping to adjust and manage your chronic conditions across that patient population that you have, while simultaneously reducing care and revenue gaps. Additionally, we're helping to identify chronic conditions that have not yet even been submitted on a bill for this year. Um, and that, again, is to make sure that as you're submitting information out, um, especially with the HCC world and the outpatient side, um, we want to make sure that your chronic patients are, of course, they're being given the care, 
um, that they are needed to treat those chronic conditions, but are we documenting that that care is being provided? And are we being properly reimbursed for the care and the level of care that we've provided? That's really where these nudges are coming in to help, especially with identifying any items that previously were not submitted as part of the HCCs um, on a bill. And finally, we'll touch on one of our newer coming uh, nudge items related to clinical advisor. So clinical advisor is a little bit generic of a title, but that's because there are so many different use cases that we can build out through this type of interaction. So the most uh, prominent one that you see here is nudging with relevant information based on past parts of the longitudinal record. So here we have a heart failure summary card, and this is because we have access to all of that documentation for the patient in the back end. And through that, we're able to build out a summary card to display to the provider when we know the patient is an active heart failure patient. And it's something that will help the provider kind of kick off their interaction with that encounter and um, the interaction with that patient. Um, we also are able to dive into other areas where we can help with it, uh, advising the clinician during their process. So if another example here is bringing forward some best practices um, or some safety measures that previously wouldn't have been able to be brought forward in real time during the workflow. Um, so for example, uh, we've identified some information that tells me or tells our NLU that the patient is eligible for an ACE inhibitor, and we should be considering whether or not we want to adjust that medication. Um, of course, all of these nudges are able to be uh, enabled and disabled on a per nudge basis, so it's not that all of your providers would see this, um, but really trying to dive down into the areas where the providers need the most help or where they would find the most benefit. So this brings us to nudge theory, and we've talked about nudges a lot through um, this conversation, and hopefully you picked up on that, because we do find that nudges and uh, provider queries sent from a CDI are distinct items from one another. So what nudge theory really means is bringing real-time nudges that are meant to balance the information delivery and recommended action while simultaneously being highly relevant and non-obtrusive. So really, in order for something to count as a nudge, we really think there are two pieces to this. The intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid, and the nudges should not be mandates, which means that they really should not include hard stops. So with the nudges we have today, there are no hard stops. They're small, they're easy, they're cheap to avoid because you can continue through your normal workflow, but we're also giving you that uh, education right in workflow and trying to get uh, documentation corrected before the document has even been signed and put through the legal medical record. So really trying to shift the focus to um, even before a retrospective of or a concurrent query are sent. Um, the example used in this article to discuss nudge theory, and I, I find it to be a really good example, is that nudge theory is putting fruit at eye level. That counts as a nudge. But banning junk food does not count as a nudge. That would be more of a hard stop. So that's, a, I think, a really simple example to explain how nudges can be proactive in helping providers to make that choice, but part of it is also in the education, helping them to understand why they should make that choice. So nudge theory has guided us towards proactive physician support to transform the EHR documentation experience and identify and address care gaps. We also look for nudge theory to reduce rework and minimize disruptive retrospective queries. So let's talk a little bit about the physician engagement piece. Um, why this approach? Why nudge theory? And why at this exact time? And another question, why do so many health system executives have such similar interest in this? Physician engagement is key to so many parts of our workflows, and yet it's so difficult to get at the exact same time. Um, this conflicting environment that you see on the screen here is exactly what our con clinicians operate in every day, not only for documentation quality, but for revenue accuracy as well. So engaging the clinician at the golden moment is the key to success. And uh, doing so with nudging in non-obtrusive ways is a very strong path forward in engaging the physician during that time. So for example, um, I have up on the screen a research article um, that was put out by Health Affairs. And um, in this research article, they found that receiving more than the average number of AI-driven messages was associated with a 40% higher probability of burnout in the end. Um, obviously, that's what we're trying to avoid here, though the technology we're trying to introduce does seem like AI-based messages. 
Um, so some of the differences that we've seen from this research article and our approach in the market is that the nudges being something that is a soft touch and there is no hard stop involved with it, um, those soft touches are uh, received much more uh, willingly by our provider population. They're much more willing to interact with that, especially when they understand that this is going to save me a CDI retrospective query a week or two weeks down the road. When I've totally forgotten about the patient, um, the patient's no longer in-house, so I have to go re-review their record. So rather than, um, rather than focusing in on the in-basket messages that are based on some algorithm from the EMR, we can use our NLU to leverage that real-time analysis of documentation and try to prevent some of those AI-driven messages in the EMR inboxes by utilizing this in-workflow messaging instead. Move to the next slide here. Um, so the AHA conducted a CDI survey um, revealing some of these physician engagement challenges. So just a couple of numbers up here that I'd like to review with everyone. Um, the first number is probably the most prominent, and I can't say that any of us are really surprised by this. 98.5% um, of CDI programs believe that their physicians could be doing a better job at documentation. And of course, um, it's not that the CDI programs are uh, with a lack of trying to improve that documentation practice, but there's so much being asked of our clinicians again that it's hard to get them fully involved and integrated into that workflow. 66.5% um, of the uh, of providers that responded to this said that the lack of understanding of the importance of the documentation practices um, are why they are not responding to those uh, retrospective queries. And I think that this touches back really nicely to the ability to do more in workflow education versus the classroom training. Um, and maybe not even versus the classroom training, but in um, extending the classroom training to the in practical workflow. Um, that I believe is the best way for your providers to start interacting with the nudges on a real time basis and understanding what those documentation um, pieces are and the requirements and the reason why it's so important. Also, when educating the provider and making them understand that um, by answering some of these uh, low-hanging fruit nudges up front, we can help reduce those retrospective queries in the back end, which, again, goes back to saving them time. So this isn't just going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, there are a bunch of different areas that we need to focus in on and make small adjustments to to be able to kind of alleviate um, some of the time uh, restrictions that we've put onto our providers. Okay, um, so lack of time. I mean, obviously, 44% of the providers uh, believe that um, there is lack of time causing an obstacle for physician engagement. And none of us should be surprised by that either, because as we've mentioned a couple of times, we're asking a lot from our providers in today's world, not only seeing the patients and completing documentation, but making sure that the documentation is fully specified, meeting quality reviews. Um, so they're constantly being spread very thin, um, and that's where the lack of time comes from. And then finally, lack of interest. Um, I think it's easy from our perspective to see that the clinician base might show a lack of interest, but from their perspective, um, they're just seeing it as another thing to pile on top of the continued requests that were being, uh, are being made to their, to their groups. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the golden moment. Um, so the golden moment is really a small window of time um, that we've been referring to uh, for the workflow throughout this presentation. Um, this golden moment really refers to the ability to drive um, an in-workflow solution real time. So as I'm creating documentation, that golden moment comes when that documentation is actively being generated and I've not yet signed that note. Or even if I'm editing a note, what we're trying to do is get it in there preemptively. So these tools during that golden moment are continually analyzing the information, both on your current document as it's being built out, but as well as looking at past parts from the encounter. So reaching back out to our backend system to identify how many times has heart failure been mentioned? Do we have ejection fraction listed somewhere? What about a B and P value? And additionally, if we're looking across the encounter, has the specificity for heart failure already been documented? Um, because if it has already been documented for the encounter, then on today's current note, there's no sense nudging the provider for that because that's just an additional question that we don't technically need an answer to at this point. Um, consistency is great, but we need to again focus on that golden moment and making sure we're delivering the message at the right time when most appropriate.
Um, overall, this will allow us to drive more efficient note creation, and this helps to transform the clinician's experience while simultaneously creating that higher quality documentation. Um, so let's go ahead and move then into what this interaction in the golden moment means for your healthcare organization. So um, we need to talk about how we can move the needle and engaging with the clinician during that golden moment is how we do that, nudge by nudge. Um, so for the information that's listed here on the slide, you can see, of course, the nudge for heart failure um, being displayed. It's very similar to what we saw with past examples from the NLU wheel slides. Um, but to the right-hand side, um, we had some of these outcomes come out of one of our largest IDNs um, that we work with on the Engage One product. Um, so there was a 25% re reduction in discharges from baseline um, over the first couple of months of the project for their unspecified heart failure documentation. Um, what that means is that there were less bills going out the door with those unspecified heart failure claims on them. So we were overall able to help increase the specificity of documentation. Um, through that increase in documentation, we were also able to increase a 7.5% increase in uh, CC capture or MCC capture, which of course all of that does play into the DRGs later on down the line. And probably and most notably, um, there was a 5% increase in the case mix index that was um, attributed to the Engage One technology. So 5% for one program may not seem like a large amount of um, increase in the CMI, but with as large of an IDN that um, we were working with on seeing this increase in CMI, they saw a significant revenue return because of being able to move the needle with the nudging um, and using that as an extra option as part of their CDI workflow. All right, um, I'd like to pass it over to Kathy at this time. Thanks, Danny. So Danny's been really focusing on, you know, how we can be proactive with those nudges and messages to our providers in that golden moment. And one of the ways that I used to, as a former CDI uh, manager, was to do all of that work in formal education, you know, meeting with the providers, meeting at their business meetings, meeting at their professional meetings. And today, you know, we really want to talk about how do we avoid that retrospective query, or as I used to call this presentation, how to avoid talking to Kathy, your CDI nurse. Uh, it was one of my most popular presentations, I have to say, and it was well attended because most of the time, and I tried not to take it personally, nobody really wanted to talk to me about their cases um, after the fact. And typically, that was either days after their note had been uh, documented or in the worst case scenario, the patient's been discharged as Davey suggested. And now I have to do a mini re-review to remember what was going on with that patient. So really bringing education out of the classroom and into the physician documentation workflow. I mean, that's really what we're talking about today. Leveraging technology, you know, to improve the quality at the time of the note creation. I used to say the best thing I ever read in a note was when a provider said in the note, patient is known to me. Uh, because that really means that, you know, maybe I can ask questions that, um, you know, speak to a deeper level of understanding and really getting in the specificities around uh, information that really helps, you know, tell that story. Um, we really want to make sure that we're promoting and information driven. We're consistent, reliable. We want to make sure that all of our, our clinical references are credible and, and have that deeper level of reasoning. And so, unfortunately, it does not mean that the CDI team is, um, you know, not going to have work to do. Um, as long as I was a CDI manager, I never found the FTE ferry, and I always had more cases and more work than I had staff for. So this really does help extend CDI programs and coverage to get into those other payers that I can't reach now because I am writing a heart failure query on too many patients that could be typed in acuity right off the bat if the, if the provider would have had that deeper level of understanding. You know, this is where we used to hand out pocket cards and education and training, and really the at the elbow support is really that technology piece at this point. So again, you know, are we going to not see our provide our CDI programs um, be as um, uh, you know strong or, or robust? Absolutely not. We're going to provide clinically driven analysis for them as well because if I'm taking them off some of this low hanging fruit, I want them to have some technology that can dive deeper into the record. 
We want to go deeper into those non-discrete fields. You know, I'm not going to look at problem lists. I'm not going to look at drop downs. I only want to go into those discrete um, areas. And how I do that is really that clinically driven analysis. Davey went over this really well, so uh, I'm just going to highlight the fact that in these clinical concepts, you know, in these, this example is heart failure and diabetes, we take those core, um, you know, um, medical conditions and we use that natural language processing and then the outer circle around that, we do do that deeper level of uh, uh, clinical analysis and what we call understanding, which is that deeper reasoning, and then create those application circles. And in this example, um, the CDI professionals, whether they're coding or clinically um, experienced, we would apply that to ICD-10 codes, um, whether it's um, medical or, or procedural, and then the ambulatory space HCCs. Well, we would take that information and then create what we consider enhanced prioritization. So using algorithms that takes in this clinical information and computes a score for prioritization. I always say if I only have 30 charts to look at today, I want to make sure they're the most meaningful charts that I can um, put my hands on. Um, and I really want to know that there's opportunity to really fill in those gaps of um, documentation integrity. How I would do that is um, teeing up information. And again, I want to create some, uh, some technology here so that when the CDI has that opportunity to go deeper into records, I don't want them to waste time having to peruse through multiple days, especially if it's a long stay, there's a complicated case. So what we do is we take that natural language understanding um, technology and apply um, these evidence sheets, which says I have gone through all aspects of the record. I've gone through the radiology reports, the MARs, the lab reports, progress notes, et cetera, and now I have given you the ability to create some information that would be meaningful for someone who's looking for gaps in documentation. These conditions, uh, over 400 conditions, um, 12 rules on sepsis alone, um, but take into the fact, you know, the, the changing aspects of some of these more complicated conditions. Sepsis for one, um, all the new criteria, and, you know, organizations may choose to use sepsis two. They may be using SOFA criteria. They never want to see anything sent to the provider around sepsis if I don't have an organ dysfunction. All of that information is taken into account for this clinical reasoning. In this example, you can see we have evidence of malnutrition, but there's still, still something missing. I don't have the severity. I want to know that, that level of detail, and I'm giving you all of the evidence that supports that level of understanding. But what's significant is at the bottom, I'm also telling you what I didn't find. So it knows that Kathy Harkness is looking for certain elements in the malnutrition case and she's going to be looking for these elements. And if I don't find them, she needs to know that as well. So now I can use my clinical discernment and use the sustainability to decide, do I need to query? Can I say that I have enough to, that the coder will be able to add this as a, uh, a diagnosis on this uh, encounter? Or do I need more information? So these clinical evidence sheets really help with that deeper level understanding and reasoning and decision-making process. So how do we put this all together? Well, when we look at the, the, the query workflow, you know, that clinical evidence sheet, we have the ability to take all that evidence and put it into a, form, a more formal traditional query. We can build that right into their workflow so that they find it easier to engage physicians. Do I need to send that query in a formal workflow? Uh, meaning, do I send it to their in basket? We know that's not necessarily desirable at this point, but if that's the only uh, opportunity I have, we can certainly do that. Um, do I have the ability to send something a little bit faster? So I, do I have the ability to engage the physician within their own workflow? When they are uh, work, looking at that patient's record, they're sitting down, they're focused, they're going to create a note, or they're going to be reviewing that patient's chart, and then creating that nudge or that message, um, in this case, it would be a, a query, um, into that, uh, that workflow. So again, 
taking advantage of that golden moment. So when they have the, the wherewithal to do that, you know, chasing them down the hall and standing outside um, patient doorways and, and such, which I hate to say it, I've done, I've done all of those things, um, is really not the most effective way. And I've learned my lesson. I've had my hair parted a few times. Um, so I obviously know that this is a much better way to um, create this dialogue with our, with our partners. So again, does that mean that the physician sees that the process built into their doc workflow is effective? Yes, it does. It's seamless, it's integrated, um, and it's at their convenience. It's not a hard stop, and we're hoping to create more time to care and reduce um, burnout. And we really want to make sure that, you know, we're being not only credible partners, but we see this as we know there's competing priorities, but we want to do it in a smart way that makes it um, seem as we are on the same team and giving them that opportunity to do it um, in a way that's convenient for all, but it still gets it done. So a little bit in summary here, you know, we're talking about closed loop. We've gone from, you know, talking about what is proactive, what's real time, you know, what those nudges in that, in that golden moment, you know, deficiencies. But yet there will still always be those retro, really active retrospective queries. But what we want to see is a shift, right? We want to see that there's an opportunity to have room in our toolbox for balance and deploy them strategically in a way that makes sense for the organization um, and, you know, your culture. Because the end goal and the end game is actual clinical documentation integrity. And I think that's more important than improvement. Improvement, you know, can be very vague, but what we really want is, you know, close those gaps, create the, that document that is rich with the patient stories. So when the coder goes to enter the codes, it really does have that element um, accuracy so we can feel confident. Because what I like to say is all these efforts are really your concurrent appeal process. Because once the record is locked and loaded and the story is told, anyone can come back and look at this and say, oh, what was done here? Oh, okay, now I understand why you coded that this way. That definitely makes sense. There's clinical validity. All of the, you know, I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and um, hopefully um, we're telling the story that we need to tell. So, Davey, if you can just kind of wrap up and, and kind of talk about what our key takeaways are, I think that's, that's where we are. Absolutely. Thanks for that great information, Kathy. So before we jump into our key takeaways from today's session, I just do want to call attention that there is um, a survey off to the side. I believe it's two questions. If you'd like to take part in that survey, please feel free to. Um, otherwise, uh, we'd be looking forward to the Q&A questions as part of our next segment. Um, so to recap what we covered today, um, we covered how it's possible to reduce the care gaps within the um, healthcare field in the CDI process by leveraging technology. Um, that technology is done and engaging with providers in a more effective means than previously thought possible. And by using these more effective means for engaging your providers, you're driving outcomes and reducing that burden on them simultaneously. As we discussed, there's a lot being requested of our clinicians today, and anything that we can do to try to drive outcomes and simultaneously take some of that uh, weight off of their shoulders is what we should look forward to. And of course, all of this being done through a closed workflow, a closed loop workflow enables all of the parties to be involved and for all of the parties to benefit from it. So I think with that, I just want to personally thank everyone for attending today. Um, big thank you to Beckers for helping us put all of this together and looking forward to how we can continue to close the loop between clinical care and revenue integrity. Thank you, Kathy and David, for that fabulous presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. We will try to get through as many questions as possible. So I'm going to jump into an audience question that we got during the presentation to start out with. And David, I'll have you tackle it first. And then Kathy, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have as well. This audience member wants to know, how do you focus on quality of healthcare delivery during something like the COVID-19 pandemic? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, that's the same question that 3M and Modal asked ourselves as well, starting back in March and April timeframe. Um, so we went through a couple of different approaches into trying to help out with the COVID-19, um, uh, the pandemic in the market. So with the information that you saw today with the CDI engaged nudges, um, we did, did build nudges based off of the COVID-19 information. And most of them were around educational items, looking at symptoms, uh, better treatment, how to protect your patients, really more of an educational piece for the provider. Um, but of course, we can also uh, nudge on evidence of COVID-19 being in place, even though the evidence is a little fuzzy at this time. Now, of course, that helps with the clinicians and the documentation, but what else do we need to do in order to um, combat COVID-19 across the whole healthcare delivery system? So that also includes our CDI staff, our quality staff, um, those people who need to really have a more accurate representation of where are the COVID-19 patients in your population today. Um, so really from the uh, back inside the CDI workflows would be looking through, we would be lifting forward those evidence sheets that Kathy had shown to you, um, identifying where COVID-19 was mentioned and most of it from our customers anyway, uh, they wanted mostly reporting. They just wanted to know where and who they need to uh, talk to and where the gaps might be in the process. So that's really been where we've been supporting COVID-19 for the most part is the, in the identification piece, but we can also do the evidence-based items as well. So this is Kathy. Then, Kathy I, I agree. Perfect. Yeah, I agree with everything, David. I, the only other thing I would add is just remember we're collecting data. So, uh, you know, when we're trying to figure out because of the data being, you know, kind of all over the place, you know, it's, do you have COVID toes? Do you have a COVID cough? Do you have, I mean, all of the different elements. And so we're, we're, we're basically throwing our net pretty wide right now. Um, with everyone else, right? And so what we're doing is is being able to to look in the discrete and the non-discrete fields, right? We're really looking into getting into that narrative of saying, you know, yes, you know, they they've had a COVID test. It's maybe suspicious. It's you know, you know, just really trying to cast the net. But after we've casted that net and we've collected all that, we're collecting that rich data so that we can learn from it. And you know, you know, taking all of that ontologically mapped data you know, all of those elements by using, you know, SNOMED and, and LOINC and RADLEX and RX norms and all of those ontologies, mapping it to a CDA level three, which is, um, you know, really a, a rich data source so that we can send it to whatever um, extraction surface or pop health or, you know, whatever you need to do to really, you know, query that data so that you can look for those, um, those best practice scenarios, right? That's what we're finding out. What's the best bed? What's the best position um, for these patients? So I think that's the data richness when we talk about quality. Yes, we can kind of give education at the, at the time of the encounter, but what's going to happen after the encounter when we really have all that rich data is exciting to me. Fabulous. Thank you both. Um, Kathy and David for sharing your insights on that question from our audience member. The next question is, could you expand on how this contributed to case mix index? And this question came um, around when we were discussing nudging. So David, I would love if you could take a stab at that one first. Yes, yeah, certainly. So with that um, example that we had provided around the 5% increase in CMI, that was really truly driven from the engaged nudges around heart failure. So it was, of course, a very large IDN. And the reason that the CMI increased for that IDN specifically is there was a large amount of documentation um, that was lacking specificity. So they, for as long as we know of, had been underreporting the quality of care and the level of care that they were providing for their patients. And this, again, was just a, an issue more in the physician engagement and them understanding where the education pieces of CDI come in and why they're so important. So when we introduced the technology, that's where we saw that steep drop off of the unspecified heart failures going out. And by being able to kind of adjust that level of severity of each of those patients over the course of those couple of months, that's where we saw that CMI shift come from. So of course, that's a very specific example on one IDN. Um, each organization would have a, 
I guess, a difference in the way that we would be able to impact the CMI because each organization has different issues that are currently bringing their CMI down. Um, so that's something that's part of our normal project plan to define the ways and the KPIs that we can measure and uh, confirm that we're bringing benefit to the program. Totally. Thank you so much, David, for clarifying that. The next question I have today is, what other workflows are available to the provider outside of what was discussed here today? And Kathy, can you grab that one for us? Well, my goodness, um, you know, my favorite quote is by Dr. James C. And he said, if you've seen one CDI program, you've seen one. And, you know, when you talk about workflows, that's really, you know, the path you tend to go down. You know, the first thing you want to, you know, talk about when you're talking about adding technology is, you know, who are your people? Who are your, what are your processes currently? What's your current state? What would you like your future state? You know, what are the denials? You know, a lot of times we get into the denials conversation um, because that really is kind of going back to, you know, is our documentation leading to that? You know, is that something that we need to be looking on? So the workflows that we're talking about in, in and above just the, prov the provider workflows and then the CDI workflows is, you know, coding, denial, case management, um, you know, quality for sure. So all of those different pieces of a very complex um, pie that we're trying to to do is really, you know, those are the types of things that we would like to investigate and, and kind of assist with because I think that technology definitely can leverage and assist with a lot of these different uh, challenges that organizations are, are coming into. And uh, I'm really grateful for the background that I have because I feel like when people start talking to me about, you know, what challenges they're having, I, I definitely have felt it in my, in my experience. So um, I'm very excited that, you know, technology can assist with that, but it's not just the technology we know. And so, um, you know, we do definitely need to pull in all of the stakeholders and address what workflows um, need to be addressed in, in documentation issues. Yeah, and to extend on um, what you said there, Kathy, I think from the, the clinician perspective, um, the workflows really are endless. So we gave examples today of CDI workflows, HCC workflows, that clinical advisor is very vague and large. Um, but within that clinical advisor, um, we're also able to do things that are more associated to like a Siri-like functionality where you would be able to speak with the application and get the most recent ejection fraction um, or maybe the most recent medication for that patient and have more of a conversational um, dialogue going back and forth with the technology. Um, so we're looking to expand into workflows like that, but also um, your scribing workflows, um, some of the uh, workflows related to radiology can also benefit from the CAPD technology. Um, so overall, it really depends on the audience that we're looking at, what the problem at the hospital or organization is and how we can best address it through that um, kind of one platform that can bring the various types of nudges into a single space for the provider. Totally. Thank you so much for laying that out. I think it's a good point that there is not just one workflow. There are very, very many. Um, so we're kind of nearing the top of the hour, but I have a few more questions I'd love to sneak in. The next one I have for both of you, I would love both of you to weigh in on this one. Um, and this audience member says, physician engagement is a challenge for us. Are there ways you can ensure that physicians will engage with your technology and will trust it to help them instead of being another burden? And David, can you grab this one first and then Kathy, I'll have you weigh in. Sure thing. So I really what I've seen with the experience with these tools out in the market is that your providers need to really be bought in on the vision of the product. So it's one thing to buy um, and look into AI and how it can help, but if you're not addressing the physician's actual problems, then you're not actually doing anything except adding additional burden to them. So what we've seen is during implementation, we treat it more as a marketing effort with the provider population. We get them excited about the technology and make them understand and help them to understand why is it going to be so beneficial for me to listen to these little nudges that come up to me versus an actual human being on the back end. 
And really, again, it's just about identifying those low-hanging fruit, addressing them quickly and efficiently, so that way it frees up time for yourself and your CDI staff at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree, Davey. I then, think that, you know, the, the key here is helping your providers understand that it's they, they have a choice of how they're, when, or, when and how they're going to answer, you know, these questions that are priorities for the organization. It's not a match in of if, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of when. And, you know, education and buy-in and, and really helping them understand uh, the what's in it for them or, you know, how it's going to help and assist with their, with their work is really the key features. And, but, you know, again, I just go back to, you know, it's not that I'm not, you're, you're going to have this question. I'm just trying to find the most appropriate time to, you know, have this, you know, interrupt or, or add to your workflow um, and have those, those, those discussions up front because the last thing you want to do is, you know, just kind of pop this in there and then see this as something that they don't, you know, uh, our adoption specialists are just, you know, the best at, you know, helping people, you know, walk in step with our providers and, and, the, and the staff and team just to help them, you know, create that workflow environment and to see the ease of it and to, to see that the, that the long-term goal is to really is to give them extra time in their day so that they don't have to do anything retrospectively. So, um, you know, I think that's what makes us, you know, class leaders in, in, in this field. Uh, with, is our customer service and our adoption specialists of getting us, you know, getting those providers to understand why this is important and why it will help them. Thank you both so much. It's great to hear how 3M is really kind of making that part of their process. Love to hear that. Um, so. I have one more question for you both today before we uh, end for the day. And that is, are there any benefits to the CDIs getting visibility into physician documentation behavior? And Kathy, can you grab this one first? And David, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well after. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of what, so, uh, you know, definitely change, you know, management and, and trying to help that behavior change, um, it, you know, is one of those things that we focus on and, and trying to, you know, make sure that I, I'm not, I'm trying to think how I could say this differently than what would I ask. Mm -hmm. David, do you mind going first on this one? Cause I'm kind of struggling with say it differently than I, than I did last time. Sure. And if you could actually repeat the question, I it broke up at the end there for me. Yes, absolutely. So the question is, are there any benefits to the CDIs getting visibility into physician documentation behavior? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think that that is one of the most beneficial things that we can do for the CDI is to kind of give them that view into the physician perspective. It's so easy for us to all get um, kind of locked into our own silos and not really fully understand the workflow or the day-to-day -day of whether it be the physicians if you're on the CDI side, whether it be the CDI staff if you're a physician. So I think it's really important for the uh, physicians to be able to see things that CDI is sending to them, but also what is the normal interaction with the nudges on your encounter and allowing the CDI specialist to see that as well whether that helps them to just understand um, before I send out this heart failure query, let me just look to see how many providers across this encounter have been nudged for this information previously. Or maybe there is one provider I had in mind that I want to send the query to, and that would, uh, having that information available to me would allow me to then say, yes, they've actually been prompted for it previously, and I can bring this up to them when I see them and say, I know you received nudges for it. How can we make sure we get this documentation updated within your uh, within the encounter. So I think it's really helpful to be able to share the information yeah. between all of the workflows so everyone's educated. Yeah, I mean, I think the difference between a new query and a follow-up as opposed to, you know, and having that ability to say, oh, I saw this is much more, is a much better conversation than, you know, just coming out and sounding like you don't have any insight into what was going on with them. Great. Thank you both so much for tackling that question as well. 
that is all the time we have for today, though, unfortunately. I want to thank Kathy and David for their excellent presentation and 3M Health Information Systems for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.